One of the recurring plot devices in the Sword Art Online series is a game with greater stakes. Whether it's mind control experiments in Alfheim, a string of killings in Gun Gale Online, memory loss in Ordinal Scale, or soul destruction in Underworld, Sword Art Online as a franchise has revolved around adding gravity to our usual gaming routine. It really is an interesting twist on the game of death trope, making it relatable and alluring through its backdrop against the typical new game launch hype that pervades modern game marketing and presenting the dream game experience of a full dive virtual reality MMORPG. It's a fun idea to read about in fiction, but could the Sword Art Online incident actually happen in real life? I'll be going over just that in this video, leaving the other arcs for other videos on this channel, so be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to watch those videos as soon as they release. For the sake of this video, we'll be pretending that Full Dive technology both exists and works. We'll see if we can actually be trapped in a game how a single developer could take control of an MMO, the odds of rescue, and if a consumer product could truly fry our brains quickly enough to warrant this incident happening. There's quite a lot on the agenda, so let's get this started. Everything here begins for players the moment they realize that there is no logout button. In any other medium, this isn't a problem. Alt F4, walk away from the screen, take off your head mounted display, put down the controller system, it's not that hard. Full Dive VR specifically is the only medium where this doesn't work. To achieve Full Dive level VR, regardless of the technology used, you must paralyze the user in some way to prevent them from hurting themselves or others. While disabled IRL, the only way to get out is to disengage the full dive mechanism, which can only be done through the application, a firmware backdoor, or a third party stopping the machine. If these three methods are unavailable, users will be at the mercy of software and rescuers if any bug or malicious actors limit our ability to log out. Which brings us to our next point. Could one rogue programmer really hijack an entire system? MMOs are worked on by whole teams of developers, in most cases, and the software is usually distributed across a large number of independent servers that, at best, do a check-in with a main project. What are the chances of one person on the team being able to go rogue and take over the whole network then? Not as low as one would like. Software control is often restricted via passwords and permissions that different people have. This is good if the villain is a low-level grunt, but in the case of an individual like Kayaba Akihiko, who was the head developer behind the project, nobody could really control him. Meaning that if he wanted to get code into the final build, he had all the authority he needed to do so. Unfortunately, it really can be a matter of one person in the right place, with the right access and the right tools to upend an entire game. With the bug, virus, or malicious code out in the wild then, what's stopping us from cleaning things up on our end? Several things, actually. Computer chips feature components small and fragile enough that we aren't reasonably able to control them through externally direct means. Whatever solutions we implement must either be directly through software or through disabling the electrical circuit altogether. Software-wise, the ability to modify the execution is dependent on the built-in I.O. and operating systems. For example, something like a PLC or microcontroller requires a separate computer to modify the unit, while a computer has the keyboard and mouse and its own operating system like Windows to be worked with. Some even have BIOS flashing options in order to directly interface with the motherboard. If the computer BIOS doesn't allow online debugging, technicians wouldn't be able to do anything. If it did though, it becomes a battle to crack the software safely by delivering the disengage command. When you consider just how ludicrous encryption and security for something like this could be, it could take years or even decades to pull off. The other option here would be to cut the power or short the circuits. 
Turning things off here stops the processors from receiving, manipulating, and outputting data, and flushes volatile memory devices like RAM and cache. The hardware integrity is spared, meaning the option to reset things if the desired software is still available from a more permanent memory source exists. Shorting things will likely overwhelm the transistors and cause them to break down, breaking just about all the components and rendering them to a little more than scrap. Both methods ultimately stop the software from running, so the only remaining question would be if the death mechanism could kill the user faster than we could remove the headset. The final question. Could the Nerve Gear kill? In Sword Art Online, the electromagnetic transceivers used to achieve full dive were directed by Kayaba to release microwaves to kill the players. Microwaves range from one millimeter to one meter in size, and with the Nerve Gear sophistication, it's safe to say that it could target whatever would be the most essential parts of the brain to increase lethality. Thus, the deciding factor on life or death here is how much power the transceivers could deliver in a short time frame. Here is the best case scenario for Kayaba. Assuming a target temperature increase of 10 degrees over the average, targeting a conveniently fatal 1 cubic millimeter or 0.0011 grams of brain to be raised up under water specific heat to functionally kill you within a optimistically given half a second of time to remove the headset for Kayaba, giving the mechanism 100% efficiency in converting the waves to heat, only 0.09 watts would be needed to kill, well within the battery capacity of even a cell phone, let alone a helmet sized nerve gear. So, it's very well within the realms of possibility if these were the circumstances he were working with. Of course, these are some very, very favorable circumstances. Let's look at the flip side. Consider for a moment how much of our brains we can actually live without. While the 10% of our brains myth is nonsense and our brains are fairly heavily taxed at all times, the amount of that which is necessary to our functioning and livelihoods isn't very high and people have survived with large parts of their brains removed. If Kayaba wanted to assure death, he'd need to increase the brain's temperature well past a fever, let's say by 14 degrees C, over at least a cubic centimeter of area at the brain's stem and with less than a tenth of a second to work with. As I assure you, we can engineer something that can remove or destroy the Nerve Gear's transceivers in less than a hundredth of a second no problem but I'm still gonna be nice here, just for the sake of the argument. Under those conditions, the power requirement goes from 0.09 watts to around 643 watts. Still possible for a consumer device, but there is no way it's going to make it to market with such a glaring safety hazard. Most laptop batteries are only allowed to be 100 watts before they don't allow them on a plane. Do you think they're gonna allow a 600 watt battery to be right next to people's brains? That just wouldn't make into market without some serious legal mismanagement. So don't worry everybody, nothing on that level should be able to fly by with no problems. To conclude, a lot of aspects of the Sword Art Online incident are scarily plausible. Full dive level virtual reality uniquely enables you to be trapped within games. It is possible for one developer or terrorist to hijack a piece of software across a network and deliver malicious code to everyone. It is possible to design a mechanism to attempt to kill you based on software with the only contentious element here being the microwaves. Just as a kitchen microwave can't cook your hot pocket through in one second, the chances of a consumer device for playing games taking you out faster than it could be removed are slim. That being said, if Kayaba found a part of the brain that he could heat fast enough within the typical battery capacity allowed for a consumer product, his SAO disaster could very well come to pass. You know, that or he could have just made the batteries blow up. Helmet sized Galaxy Note 7 battery right next to your brainstem, pressed up tightly against it, seems a little bit more likely to work if you ask me. Whoops, that's one part of Kayaba I don't want to reflect. Thank you very much for watching this video everyone. 
I'm doing more of these Sorta Online analysis videos soon, so remember to like the video, subscribe, ring the bell icon, and join the Discord server to support the channel. Till next time, my fellow adventurers and dreamers, this has been Gregory, logging out.